I'd like to start by introducing uh, Dr. Ann Friedlander. Ann is a uh, research scientist and professor at Stanford with a focus on exercise physiology and its importance as we go through life. And Ann, please take it away. Now it's on? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, welcome everyone to this open forum. It's a pleasure to see you here today. And my slides will be coming up in a moment. <laughs> Not that slide. <laughs> that slide, the start of the talk. Okay. So as you can see from my title, I'm going to be talking about the effects of physical activity on health and aging. Now, you're all here at Vail, so you're in this session, you're paying attention to these issues, you may be very active yourself, or you're visiting, you're either visiting or living here. And so you probably know a lot about physical activity already. So I'm going to try and give you some new nuggets of information, some, some information on how powerful physical activity really is in the aging process, and also address some challenges that we all face in the modern world um, to try and get that activity into our lives. So, the second title to this, which you already got a preview of, is Your Body is Amazing. So that's a fun topic, right? So your body is amazing. What I mean by that is it's highly adaptive. So it's adaptive in both directions, right? So if you're doing something new, like for me coming to Vail about 8,000 feet, my body is changing behind the scenes to adapt to this altitude. <coughs> you may be starting a new training program. Your body adapts to that. You may just be walking around the block for the first time. Your body's adapting to that. So all these things go on behind the scenes, sometimes without you even paying attention to it, to make your life easier, to make that next visit to Vail, that next walk around the block easier. So it's really amazing. Thing is that your body adapts rapidly in the other direction too. So even if you're just sitting around for the day, listening to scientific talks or on your email or whatever, your body is changing where it's directing those resources. It doesn't need to maintain that muscle mass anymore. It doesn't need to maintain its energy systems for exercise if you're sitting around for a long time. So you'd be surprised at how quickly four hours, eight hours of sedentary behavior can impact how your body behaves. So these next three slides are probably going to be review for some of you. But 85 years old could look really different. So you can look like this gentleman here who's in a nursing home who's dependent on all his care needs from others. Or you can look like Alma Kent here, pictured at age 85, running the London Marathon, looking good, right? Some of you may be 85 already, and you're all looking good. Uh, so if I were to ask people in this room at age 85, what would you rather be doing? I'm sure it would be unanimous that you'd rather be like Alma Kent, out there doing your thing. So there are certain things involved in aging that are beyond your control. You, know, you have genetic predispositions, you have injuries, certain illnesses can change the trajectory of aging. But what I'm here today to say is that there are a lot of things that you can do throughout your life to change that trajectory in order to be more like Alma and less like the other gentleman. Actually, if you can maybe keep those slides up, I'll be referring back and forth to them. It would be handy. Um, so we call that uh, choose your path to healthy aging. So healthy aging or successful aging. <clears throat> so this is how aging is frequently depicted in the literature. You, know, you get older, you get muscle weakness, functional capacity goes down, you exercise less, genetics play a role in there somewhere, uh, decreased energy expenditure will lead to abdominal obesity, and all of that contributes to a variety of risk factors associated with disease. And now with new information, we'll throw in brain function as well. So those things work together. The physiology actually impacts cognitive function as we age. That seems pretty depressing, right? It's a pretty grim picture of aging. But I actually look at this with great optimism. And the reason is, is that physical activity sits in the center of that whole schematic. So you change that arrow, increase physical activity, and all those other arrows switch. So you have less of a decrease in functional capacity. You have de less of a decrease in cognitive function. Your risk factors for disease go down. 
you know, less type 2 diabetes, less cardiovascular disease. So you have this very powerful element in your control that sits right in the center of all of your physiology. And by paying attention to that, you can change that trajectory of aging. That may have been remu review, but perhaps this is new. So we're actually finding that physical activity impacts aging per se. So not the external components, but the aging itself. So there's one theory of aging around telomeres. And telomeres are the little red caps, in this case red, on the end of your chromosomes. They're kind of like the plastic caps on your shoelaces that keep your laces from fraying. And they're involved in cell division. So they help the cell divide, and every time the cell divides, they get a little shorter. And it reaches a certain point where your telomeres are too short and that cell will die. So there's an association between length of telomeres and the age of your cells. Recent studies, like one by Cherkis et al. that just came out, looking at identical twins, have looked at telomere length in twins, so same genetic makeup, same age, obviously. One twin exercises regularly, the other does not. And those telomeres in the exercising twin are longer. So it's impacting the actual age of the cell. Another theory of aging is around mitochondrial DNA. So your, your DNA in the mitochondria, the powerhouse in your cell, it's in all your tissues, it's how you generate your energy, and over time it accumulates damage. And as you're, when you're younger, you have these robust repair mechanisms that can actually repair that DNA. And as you get older, you kind of lose the ability to do that. Numerous studies are out now that show that endurance exercise and um, strength training exercise can actually change those repair mechanisms. So if you look at the DNA in the mitochondria and people that are exercising, again, it looks more like a younger person. So impact on cellular aging, very, very powerful. So we all know physical activity is good. I mean, you're all in this room, so you know that, right? You can't live in this country or many countries without being barraged in the media, TV, movies, your doctor, your friends. We all should be exercising. We should be doing it probably more than we're doing it. So why, if that's the case, are exercise rates in the U.S. actually going down? So a recent study even showed that this came out this year, 2014. When you look at people reporting physical activity, adults in the U.S., for women, in 1988, people reported 20% did no physical activity for women. Now, 2010, 52% of the women in this country say no physical activity at all. And for men, it's jumped from 11 up to 44%. So about half the people in our country get zero exercise. And that zero will become significant later in this talk. So the reason is, or one reason is, that it's in conflict with our modern lives. And one of the major barriers in our modern life is time, right? We gotta pick up the kids from soccer practice, we gotta put food on the table and cook dinner, we gotta go to jobs, we have emails, we have great TV shows we wanna watch. There's a lot of stuff going on that competes for our time. And so the standard, I'm not really sure where the pointer thing is on this. So the standard activity guidelines of at least 150 minutes a week of moderate activity, or some version of that, are really unrealistic for a lot of people. And so what are we going to do about that? Well, fortunately, there's some new research coming out on high-intensity interval training. And you probably you may have heard this in the context of athletes who are trying to improve their performance. But we're starting to look at this in the context of health for individuals as well who may not be as active. So one frequently used protocol here is biking for 30 seconds at 100% output, so it's very hard, uh, four to six reps mixed in with rest, three times a week for six total sessions. So two weeks of this. So in two weeks, you get 15 minutes total of very high intensity exercise. That's it. So that's well below the guidelines. And what we find is, you get all these physical fitness adaptations that we used to associate with very large volume training, going out for you know, an hour run or something like that. So those of you who are into fitness may recognize some of these terms, increased VO2 max, so your maximal aerobic 
fitness, your cardiovascular fitness, increased endurance, muscle aerobic enzymes, buffering capacity, decreased glycogen use, in, in decreased lactate production. You know, the details are not as important if you're not familiar with those terms, but the idea is that you get all these adaptations in fitness in a very short time. And perhaps even more important from a public health perspective is that health markers improve as well. So in just a few high intensity sessions, you can get an increase in insulin sensitivity. So the foundation for preventing type 2 diabetes, which is running rampant in this country, decreased systolic blood pressure and decreased of bad cholesterol with a few more sessions added on. So we need to think about this if we're trying to get others to exercise, about maybe we can up the intensity a little bit and cut down the time, and it'll be more useful on people's lives, or more feasible, I might say. And we'll go one step farther, say that there's a study that came out this year that suggests that even five minutes of running a day can help in terms of all-cause mortality, so dying from any cause. Large study out of the Cooper Institute in Texas looked at a variety of survey and biometrics data, and they divided people up into quintiles of activity, so five different groups from lowest to highest. So we had the no activity, we have five minutes of running, and then increasing incre increments up to more than run uh, an hour a day of running. And what they found was the greatest benefit in terms of health, in terms of all-cause mortality, came from getting those least active, the, the no active group, five minutes a day of running. So if you think back on that you know, percentage, 50% of the people in our country are not exercising at all, well, let's think about starting with five minutes a day. Can we get them just over that hump? And other people have shown this as well, that the biggest gains come from getting the least active, a little bit active, and then you get sort of a law of diminishing returns after that. So what else in our modern life? Well, when I was a grad student, and I wanted to get a paper from the library to read, a scientific paper. I looked it up on my archaic computer, then I had to walk to the library, walk through the stacks, get all these heavy books of papers, go back, photocopy them, go back to my office. I'd forget a paper, I'd have to go back. Now, I sit at my desk at Stanford, I look something up online, I hit print, I reach over to my printer and I pull it up and I look at it. Very efficient, very convenient. I've now engineered that activity out of my life. And it's not just that kind of thing. You all experience it. We have escalators and elevators instead of stairs. We have washing machines in our house. We have immense amounts of screen time, whether it be computers or TV or phones. We have remotes for everything. We don't have to get up and change the channel anymore. And we drive everywhere. We live in suburbs where we travel around in our cars, where we you know, go see our friends, we go to the store, whatever. And we have drive through everything. So don't even have to get out of the car. So banks, restaurants, you know, dry cleaners. In Wyoming, you can go to the liquor store and go to a drive through and you can get not only a case of beer, but you can get a mixed drink with a saran wrap top over it, which I don't know if you have that in Colorado, but it seems like a really bad idea to me. <laughs> um, so don't bother to get home, start your gin and tonic on the way home. But the point is, we're, we're just sitting a lot. And this adds up. We were just talking this morning at breakfast about how a fitness expert was saying, you burn a lot of calories when you're exercising, but then you sit the rest of the day and you're, you, know, you burn essentially no calories for the other 23 hours plus. It doesn't have to be that way. So I'll give you one example. So to stand is grand, to sit is whatever. So sitting, it's become an independent risk factor for disease. So that is true even if you get outside activity. So if you meet those traditional guidelines and you're doing your run a day and you come back to your desk job and you sit the rest of the day, you are increasing your risk for those standard chronic diseases like type 2 diabetes. The prolonged city impacts your BMI, your fats, your glucose, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, a lot of evidence on this. And it does it really rapidly. So four hours, eight hours, your body is paying attention to you. It's starting to look at you and say, okay, I must be, I need to adapt my influences here and, and send the resources somewhere else. It turns out that interrupting city may help. So simply getting out of your chair periodically instead of sitting for three or four hours straight can help. 
And there are studies done where getting overweight people out of their chair can improve their disease risk factors. We don't know whether it's every 20 minutes, every hour, it may depend on the person, but that interruption, you should be thinking about that. And this gives us many potential targets, public health targets. So, um, you know, with technologies, walking desks, standing desks, um, reminders to get up, a lot of little things that we can do throughout our day to help our lives. So my message is not to do less. I think we should be doing as much exercise as we can. I love it. I think probably a lot of you do too. But is your body is watching you. So it is registering how you're behaving throughout the day, and it is responding accordingly, both in the good direction and the bad direction. So I actually think we do need to sweat the small stuff. We do need to pay attention to those small things throughout the day. Make those little adjustments. <laughs> take the stairs. It's not going to make you an Olympic athlete. It's going to change how your lipoprotein lipase works in your legs, which <laughs> seems really important. <laughs> Believe me, it's really important. So um, that kind of thing is done with small steps. So the bottom line, physical activity is a powerful medicine. Your body is very adaptive in both directions. And you should be thinking small. So you should be thinking about these little things throughout the day, whether it's adding the high intensity interval training in, or whether it's making your life less convenient in this era of convenience. <coughs> so that's what you should be thinking about. Thank you.